Ukraine is accusing Russia of stepping up its use of chemical weapons, particularly poison gases on the battlefield. Is this true? What impact could it have on operations? And is the Pope going full middle school cringe? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. Let's talk about all of it. Okay, so... <clears throat> I just want to point out that one of the notable changes on the front line is that there hasn't been uh, that many changes at all. You can see Russian forces still bogged down literally in Orlivka. Um, no real changes in Zaporizhia. Uh, so, which again is good news, but not really an update. Uh, a lack of a lack of news is good news, but not that interesting. Uh, but what is more important to talk about, I think, is that Ukraine is saying that Russian troops have used grenades with chloropicrin um, over 50 times in the last um, week, including 15 times yesterday. Now, what is chloropicrin? Um, so when we look it up, it is a uh, primarily an agricultural fungicide. So it's something that is probably manufactured uh, in Russia anyway. Um but it was used in World War II as a type of poison gas. And while it is carcinogenic to humans and very, very um, irritating at high concentrations, it irritates the uh, lungs, eyes, and skin, um, it is not lethal, right? It is still will poison a person. And they describe it as not as lethal as other chemical weapons. It can induce vomiting, forcing soldiers to remove their masks, exposing them to more toxic gases, right, that were used in World War II, right? Uh, but in this year, of course, it, they've already added it to Wikipedia. Ukrainian armed forces are claiming that Russia is using chloropicrin in K-51 grenades. So likely what this is meant to do uh, is to... Uh, irritate ill-prepared Ukrainian soldiers. Particularly what happens is that when you have an entrenched position, um, heavier than air gases are going to collect down into those areas, right? One of the things that you're actually trained on in chemical warfare um, is that as you're moving across a battlefield that you think may have been exposed to chemicals, uh, chemical weapons, even if you are at ground level, you may not inhale or find any irritant. But when you take, uh, for example, artillery fire and you seek cover in low ground, like a trench or a, an artillery crater, um, that may be where heavier than air gases uh, pool. And so you may find that while you've sought cover from artillery or direct fire, you might have incidentally thrown yourself into a chemical weapons uh, exposure zone. So I say that because they are potentially very effective if you're fighting an enemy who's deeply entrenched. Uh, and so you can see, again, the incentive to sort of fill these trenches with this very irritating gas, forcing Ukrainian forces to either leave the trench or uh, don protective masks. But I've honestly never seen a Ukrainian soldier with a protective mask. So that itself is pretty telling. Now, the uh, chloropicrin is still like harmful to humans. It's carcinogenic. It's not good. You shouldn't want to, uh, breathe it in or get it on you. Uh, but it's a sign again, that Russia isn't really particularly interested in adhering to international norms in this war. Um, Again, in the United States, like we could have used some CS gas, right? The U.S. equivalent irritant agent um, on the battlefield, right? In Afghanistan, would have been great to disperse a crowd, right? Without hurting anyone uh, or without rather permanently injuring anyone. Uh, but we couldn't because it was seen as too close to a law of war violation to deploy a chemical munition on a uh, civilian population. And so uh, in order to not violate any of these uh, treaty prohibitions, uh, the U.S. was just like, listen, don't use any of these. And so the fact that Russia is, it says that, again, Russia may be pulling um, pulling uh, some of its uh, restrictions in how it deploys certain weapons on the battlefield. What's also interesting is tactically, these are, again, irritant gas grenades dropped from quadcopters, uh, which is a fascinating uh, choice, but absolutely makes uh, sense, right? Moscow's troops, Ukrainian military is reporting over a thousand attacks by these these irritant gases. And, and this says that they're Geneva banned, um, and that 
a quarter of those thousand uh, uses uh, took place in the last month. So it sounds like it is escalating quite a bit. Uh, and this is a, uh, again, a tactic, I think, to prepare the battlefield for an assault, right? To create an uh, environment in which Ukrainians cannot stay in their trenches, helping to even the odds, so to speak, for advancing um, U Russian soldiers. Uh, a Ukrainian officer blogger calling himself Lieutenant Alex, for example, at the end of January, warned fellow soldiers even if jamming equipment was present uh, to prevent a precise chemical grenade drop by a drone, toxic smoke would naturally sink into an underground position and flush out defenders. So, again, this is a while not a game changer on the battlefield, I guess it could be. If if Russia were to like scale this up really heavily, uh, in turn, Ukrainians would have to adopt uh, chemical protective gear, um, at least for their uh, uh, faces, right? At least so they're not breathing it in and getting it in their eyes so they can see and breathe. Um, but you would have to be scaled up quite a bit, right? It'd have to be more than just digging out of a single bunker. And frankly... Even if it, like, it would help, but not fundamentally remake the war. Uh, this is just kind of the 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 facts. Um, it's just not that much of a game changer, right? If both forces will adapt. They will develop these protective gear. They may even sometimes develop um, uh, traps, right? Like deeper holes that will actually pull a lot of the again heavier than air gases. So like below the underground positions to kind of catch it um or even if they know the chemical composition sometimes you can literally just have a uh binding agent that you can just i don't know, pop and have it just sort of bind with whatever's in the air and kind of pull it out even just maybe even an air filter right uh would make a difference so i think there's a lot of potential solutions um that weren't even available in the first world war uh, that could potentially just mitigate this use of a weapon. Nonetheless, it is a sign of Russia's disregard for the Geneva Convention. If you're interested in learning more about the geopolitical space, right, not just the Russia-Ukraine conflict, but the whole national security realm, you want to check out the Strategic Sit Rep. This is my free newsletter, right? We only drop it uh, either once a week or once every other week, uh, depending on kind of the news cycle. Um, but it is... Uh, written by DC insiders, uh, recruited some old friends of mine with, in some cases, some pretty um, high level knowledge and, and analytic abilities. Uh, and th they're putting out the most relevant national security news. We keep it s simple for you guys. A simple, unbiased, no spin summary of what we know about a story. And then, so what? What does it mean for the larger geopolitical situation. And while we've got some of the key stories, like the death of Navalny or the fall of Abdivka, you can see in the last one, we also talked about a really significant event that almost no one's talked about. The defense minister of Indonesia, the former defense minister of Indonesia, just won the presidential election. And this is a hard line uh, military man who served under the Suharto dictatorship. So somebody who is seen as the... Uh, spear of the dictatorship uh, is has just won the Indonesian election. And it's a sign of probably changing um, changing the uh, attitudes towards, um, you know, de like democratic norms or constitutional um, uh, soft power, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but you can read all about it on the strategic set rep. And so check it out. The link is in the description. Again, it's totally free to sign up. Um, right now, we, we we don't even run ads on it. Uh, we, I just do it because I think more people could stand to be informed. Now, here's the other story I really wanted to talk about because it's pretty annoying. The Pope. Yes, the Pope. Okay, so the Pope is 87, again, because the globe is run by a bunch of 90-year-olds. And if you ever interact with a 90-year-old, you know they're not the sharpest tools in the shed. Um, but uh, he is urging what he calls the courage to negotiate on Ukraine war, but also suggests that Ukraine has been defeated, um, implying that they've lost the war with Russia and should raise the white flag. Now, this is weird, uh, that Ukraine should have the courage to negotiate and do so before things get worse. In an interview broadcast by Swiss Television, um, 
he said, I believe that, that the strongest are those who see the situation, think about the people and have the courage to raise the white flag and negotiate. Um, he said, negotiate is a brave word. When you see that you are defeated and that things are not working out, have the courage to negotiate. Um, he said, people might feel ashamed, but how many lives are being lost? Uh, there are many who want to act as mediators. Turkey, for example. Uh, don't be ashamed to negotiate before things get worse. And what I thought was annoying to me is that, okay, so I understand that as a, as a, as, as a Catholic, right, turning the other cheek to someone who's wronged you um, is an important core point of, of, of like the Catholic belief system. And certainly, uh, you know, when like when Jesus was, was prosecuted unjustly, right, uh, the point is, is that he didn't like try to try to box them up, you know, but here's the thing, guys, if you behave this way, if you're like, well, the other person is really strong, they're really strong. So you should probably just give them what they want. Problems emerge at scale at that point, which says that it is, which means that it's morally good, uh, that bullies can do anything they want if they're big and strong and that small people, um, should just take it. Right. And so this is sort of like the opposite of kind of the rules based international order. Um, and for the Pope to sit there and be like, Ukraine, you guys are you guys are fucked uh, is like, I don't know, stupid, for lack of a better term. Right. And to sit there and and as we've talked about, Ukraine, even if you believe that Ukraine won't get any any international help, which, by the way, the Europeans are ramping up their ability to support Ukraine. And when Ukraine does have substantial support, it can hold back Russian forces. And the reality is that right now, if they were to negotiate, uh, it would result in a far, far worse deal. And you know, the Pope's intent is to stop the loss of life. But the problem is that what you end up doing is giving the malevolent actors, Putin, namely, everything they want, right? So you sit there and go, oh, okay, well, if somebody, it's like saying if someone breaks into your house and starts to steal all your stuff and you go, whoa, 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 guys, 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 let's talk about, it. let's come to a middle ground at who gets the stuff in this house. You're like, no, no, one person, this is one person's house and stuff. It's mine. This other person is a criminal, right? You don't have to negotiate with criminals. That's kind of the point of a crime is that it's not a dispute with two sides. And so I say this because again, the, the Pope's message is to like stop the loss of life. And the problem is that I think while, when you zoom out and you go, okay, do you really want to create an international norm in which big countries do anything they want to small countries? And that the small countries don't have a right to resist, even if they risk losing the war, even if they're going to lose. Again, war isn't like a sporting event where there's a referee who blows a whistle and says, I declare you the winner and you the loser. Like, yeah, there are winners and losers in war, but man, there's a lot of gradient in that, right? First World War, classic example, right? You've got the, 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 the ultimate loser was Germany who signed an, uh, basically an unconditional surrender said you, the, the allies can do anything you want to our country. We are powerless to resist in contrast, right? You had, you know, and then you had the allies who were, who won, who could do anything they want to, to Germany. But then in the middle, you had all these other countries, right? So you had, for example, uh, a peace treaty that was signed by uh, the uh, the Bolsheviks who took over Russia. It was seen at the time as a really one-sided treaty, but in fact, turned out that it wasn't even, it wasn't even the worst treaty of that war, right? So, and you also have, like Austro-Hungary. You have Turkey who signed a treaty that literally dissolved their country, sort of. It was more complicated. But the point is, is that there's these there's these myriad of possible outcomes that you want to try to slide your way down that spectrum towards a more neutral or favorable outcome, right? 
And especially with someone like Putin, who said one of his objectives is to keep Kiev in the sphere of Russian influence. And so, and it's also hard because Russia already had an agreement prior to 2014 that said that they weren't going to violate Ukrainian sovereignty. And so that paper was worthless, right? So that paper was worthless. So now any negotiated settlement will require a guarantor. Someone who says, I pledge to fight Russia if they violate the terms of this treaty. And the fact is, right now, there's no party on the planet willing to do that. So, again, a, 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 when the Pope sits there and says, well, you guys should just talk about it. It's middle school rules. In the United States, they have something called the zero tolerance policy to fighting in uh, uh, schools. And that says that if there is a physical altercation of any kind, both parties are treated as culpable. Which sounds like kind of good if you don't think about it at all, but that means that if a uh, you know two hundred pound bully beats a, a, a sixty pound nerdy kid unconscious, the school's official policy is both of those kids are equally wrong, which is insane. Which is which which is not justice. That's just ensuring order, right? Like that's just a policy to ensure continued function of the school it has nothing to do with justice and this argument right by the pope has nothing to do with justice and is basically him saying you should give the bully whatever they want because otherwise he's going to beat you more which again to me is a sign is the outcome that the west needs to avoid right the West can say, listen, if you're a small country, you can resist an aggressor because all the other free countries of the world believe you, uh, support you in your struggle. And so just because you're a smaller country doesn't mean that you have to give the bully everything they want, right? You have all the, it's basically like all the nerds getting together and saying, if you try to beat up any one of us, there's going to be 70 fucking nerds swarming you just beating the hell out of you, right? And that's an effective deterrent to a bully. Uh, anyway, guys, that's all I had. This went all over the place, but I hope you guys understand how incredibly irritating it is um, for someone to to just be unable to distinguish between uh, a, a malevolent bully and a person standing up for themselves. But that's all I had, guys. Thank you so much. Like and subscribe. See ya.